What a reception awaited the Queen when she arrived at the Ramlilla ground. In the person of Mr. Shamnath, Mayor of Delhi, the people of India's capital gave Her Majesty and the Duke a civic welcome. Members of the corporation were presented. Among the photographers, a certain rivalry was evident. Estimates of the vast assembly varied, but they could not have been far short of a million on the great meeting place which lies between Old and New Delhi. The rostrum from which the Queen was to speak had been built with oriental care and artistry and had taken three months to complete. And now that the great day had arrived, with what truly Indian friendship and courtesy the royal visitors were received. Delhi Corporation presented the Queen with a two-foot model of the Qatar Minar, a building which is a famous landmark outside Delhi. The model was carved from an elephant's tusk. It's a faithful representation of the Minar, which is 240 feet high. The Duke's gift was a silver candelabra. Then the great assembly heard the Queen say how deeply touched she was by the very kind welcome she and her husband had received everywhere. The many Indians, she said, who nowadays come to Britain generally say they feel at home there. Her Majesty now knew that to come to India is to feel at home, no less. Having flown to Agra, the Queen was cheered by many more thousands as she drove on the way to the Taj Mahal. To everybody's delight, she used an open car. One of the grand sights, not only of India, but surely the whole world, is the Taj Mahal. The marble shrine built 300 years ago by the Emperor Shah Jahan as the tomb of his wife. 20,000 men labored for 22 years to build it. It is perfectly set in an exquisite garden. The Taj Mahal has often been described as the most beautiful building in the world. And like untold visitors before them, the Queen and Duke afterwards said they were captivated by its loveliness. Its conception combines noble and lyrical beauty. The Emperor Shah Jahan recruited artists and craftsmen from all parts of Asia to build and adorn it. Overshoes of velvet are worn by all visitors who enter the shrine itself. The guides allotted to the Queen claim direct descent from those who were originally appointed by the Shah Jahan. The day, unfortunately, was dull, and the marble edifice was not seen at quite its entrancing best. Nevertheless, the Queen and Duke declared that it provided one of the aesthetically outstanding impressions of all their travels. More than 300 years ago, an Indian emperor, stricken with grief over the death of his favorite wife, perpetuated her memory in the most striking monument anywhere to be seen, a poem in marble, the Taj Mahal. It was now the turn of Pakistan to be visited. Obviously, Karachi had made up its mind that it would not lag behind any Indian city in the fervor of its welcome. More than one million people live in this great seaport, and most of them seem to be along the route. President Ayub Khan, in the uniform of Field Marshal, drove with the Queen. In the garden of the state guest house, Karachi's society women held a ladies' reception to Her Majesty. They included wives of soldiers and government officials. The eastern beauty of Pakistani dress was dazzlingly displayed in a costume show. And where is the woman of whatever rank or part of the world who would not delight in such gorgeous array?
it was all very much to the liking of the fashion-conscious royal visitor. These elaborate and bejeweled dresses reflect an age and way of life far removed from our present-day Western world. But how arresting and lovely they are to behold. Perhaps nowhere else could so much human feeling have been given to the presenting of flowers conveyed to the Queen by a little blind girl. Before going to Karachi, the royal tourists had the unforgettable experience of visiting Udakpur, where their host was the Maharana. Here were presented 56 nobles, and it all seemed like stepping into the India of the past. For in Udaipur, the remarkable progress of modern India does not dim the luster of the Maharana's dynasty, with its unbroken succession of more than 1,400 years. The present ruler is the 75th of his line. Elderly people present remembered the very different atmosphere of 50 years ago when the Maharana's grandfather refused to attend the Durbar and even forbade his family to enter Delhi while India remained under British rule. Today, the Tilak, the mark of welcome touched upon Her Majesty's forehead, spoke of the genuine friendship between Britain and independent India, partners in the Commonwealth of which the Queen is the titular head. Udaipur is sometimes called the Venice of India. On one of its lakes stands the Maharana's water palace. Her Majesty was now on her way there. With good reason, the population regard their city as the glory of the state of Rajasthan. <music> to the island palace, the Queen and Duke went by launch. The subcontinent of India bewilders by its wealth of wonders. Even at this early stage of the royal tour, Her Majesty had marveled at many of them. And always there were more to come. The Maharana's palace was like a jewel set in a lake. What a contrast was the northwest frontier and the world famous Khyber Pass. Sluggish indeed would be the imagination that was not stirred here. Through this bleak road to India, even today, go many apparently untouched by the progress of more than 2,000 years since the army of Alexander the Great invaded the subcontinent. The names of British regiments are carved in rock, perpetuating the memory of those who defended the Khyber Pass in the three Afghan wars. Humble men from towns and counties, led by generals whose names were household words. One young subaltern in action here more than 60 years ago, Winston Churchill. Along a motor road built in the 1920s, now came the Queen and Prince Philip, nearing the border between Pakistan and her rugged neighbor, Afghanistan. Shagai, the fort of the Khyber Rifles, was built in 1928. The tribesmen brought sheep in honor of the royal visit, sacrificial sheep, afterward slaughtered to provide food for the chieftains. Awaiting the Queen were men whose forebears were among the historic enemies of Britain. Now that the old feuds have died down, all is peace in the Khyber Pass. But understandably, the Malaks are in no hurry to abandon the way of life followed for centuries. If these natural-born warriors compromise with the 20th century, they don't altogether accept it. Many a warrior who came to meet the Queen remembered the stirring times when a few crack shots, well hidden in this wild country, could take toll of the finest troops. The ceremony of the sheep was explained to the Queen. How long this ritual of hospitality goes back is not known. As the tribesmen are a practical race, to whom a living doesn't come easily, they pointed out that in the feast later on, each sheep would provide food for 40 men. The 
The pass runs for 27 miles, its highest altitude 3,500 feet. As the local governor and brigadier Rakhamangul explained, it is not height that gives the Khyber importance, but its position on the mountain fringe of India. Though perhaps the military glory has gone, the fame of the Khyber Pass will never be forgotten. Thank you.